I think two of the signals people uh, most often miss are human nature and economics. Okay, so what do people actually want drives an awful lot of technology uh, creation, technology development. Um, why is there so much money? Why are there so many products out there that promise to make you look or feel or seem younger? Because people want it, right? So human behavior and human a kind of innate, biologically driven desires drives a lot of the trends in technology. That's one thing people just don't look at a whole lot. The other is economics. When you look at things like space travel especially, um, why have we done so little in space in the last few decades? Because there's very little return on investment. Because there's very little way that going into space has actually made human lives better. If you want to spend a billion dollars, would you rather feed it into space travel or rather feed it into curing heart disease or cancer? Well, for the vast majority of humans alive, that the effort spent on curing heart disease or cancer is going to produce more return on investment. Or spending that billion dollars on developing a, a next generation smartphone or increasing your computing power or building new apps, for most people, has far more return on investment than does uh, the space race, for instance. I'm not saying we shouldn't go into space, but people just frequently miss that kind of fundamental question of the economics of these things. And when you combine those two, say, hey, we live in a market world, uh, what are the things people want, and how much do they want them, what are they willing to pay for them, that is going to drive the majority, not the entirety, but the majority of kind of new directions in technology. Well, humans are emotional actors. Uh, rationality is a very, very thin and fragile veneer that has come on the scene very, very, very recently after hundreds of millions of years of evolution of emotional and instinctive sort of drives. So that's, what, that's what is what drives most people. That means that we are prone to overexcitement about things in negative and positive ways. It means we're prone to mob behavior. Uh, and some of it will happen. Undoubtedly, at some point in the future, some biotech that if looked at rationally would be seen as a uh, potential uh, promise of benefit to millions or tens of millions of people will be involved in some disastrous thing that gets broadcast again and again on television, on the web, and will sway people's opinions badly against that technology. It will happen. That is just how it is. The best thing we can do is to put calm, level-headed memes and ideas and talking points out there and to anticipate these things. One of the things I try to say in More Than Human is there will be disasters. Perhaps someone will try to genetically engineer their child and have a, a horrible calamity result. The death of a, a child, something that uh, is rife for a television that looks awful in some way. Um, that would probably set that field back by quite a bit. Um, that sort of thing will happen, and we have to be prepared for it, and ready to talk about it, and ready to project that calm about it. Let's look at the big picture. But we have to go back and say, what did in vitro fertilization look like when it first came out? And it looked very creepy. Test tube babies, uh, there were protests against it, there were death threats made against the physicians that performed the first in vitro fertilization procedure. Uh, so it was extremely creepy when it first happened. Now it accounts for more than 1% of all live births in the United States, and about 4%, I believe, in Scandinavia, any place that it's subsidized. So will we get to the point where genetic engineering is as common as that? Yes, and more common than that. Now that requires uh, technical breakthroughs, it requires uh, years of seeing safe outcomes. These things don't happen overnight. Parents are extremely cautious with their children. So people worry about uh, parents rushing to embrace this technology. They won't, they'll go slowly. Because even more than the desire to see their kids well off, parents have a very, very strong desire to not harm their children. So they're gonna make steps into genetic engineering very slowly, very cautiously in response to perceived threats to their kids. That's why 
you know, cancer carrying genes or cancer causing genes or genes that increase the likelihood of some other disease will be the very first things people take care of because to them it's not going to be, oh, I'm risking my child's health to give them this advantage. No, 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 no. It's not gambling. It's I'm going to do this thing to take away this threat to my child. And only after other parents see that the first generation of kids were born this way and are born healthy will they themselves then kind of put their toes in the water. So it's going to be a very early adopter, then slightly later adopter, and so on and so on, over probably decades before it becomes very common. I don't see transhumanism creating much of a class divide. When uh, digital technologies really came on the scene, computers and the internet, we talked a lot about a digital divide and how that was going to be a very large problem. And it turns out that it hasn't been. And it hasn't been primarily because digital technology has gotten very, very cheap, very, very fast. Right? So that's the, the key question, is with enhancement technology, what will its cost curve look like? And if it's like other technologies um, that have similar behavior, it will start off very expensive. The first generation of genetic engineering will cost maybe tens of thousands of dollars, at least thousands, and it won't be very good. And then a decade later, it'll cost far less than that and be better. So if it follows that curve, then I don't think we have to worry much about a class divide. If it doesn't follow that curve, for whatever reason, the right response is not to restrict it, but to try to find ways to drop the cost or to increase access to it on for everyone and not just the very wealthy. But I don't think we'll even have to do very much of that, maybe a little bit of that. But I think largely the technologies will just get cheaper over time to the point that more and more people can afford them. I think instead of a, a stratification of society where you have the very rich that can afford an enhancements and the very poor that can't and it spreads out like this, I don't think that's going to happen. I think instead we'll have a flowering of society, a potential speciation. Now this is talking very long term here. But if you look 100 years, 150 years, 200 years in the future, it's possible that people have just taken choices in different directions that make them uh, more and more different in some way or increase the diversity that we have inside humanity. And I think that's a fundamentally wonderful thing. The Ubermensch, Friedrich Nietzsche, etc. Um, what you have there is a very us versus them mentality. It's a mentality of we're going to have some superhumans and very few uh, of those, and then a large class of sheep. You know, the, the superhuman is the wolf, and the rest of the population is the sheep. I think that's a horrible vision. It's not one that most of us would like to live through, and I don't think it's very accurate either. I think that's much more like the iPhone vision. Instead of thinking about, hey, we'll have this Ubermensch that is better than everyone else, it's really, we have this technology that augments people, and more and more people will get access to it over time. I also think that the word transhumanist is not a super useful one. Let me tell you what I mean by that. People would call me a transhumanist. I don't call myself one. Uh, the reason I don't is that I think that almost everyone on the planet is a transhumanist because the term becomes empty. That is to say, almost everyone on the planet, if you offer them a technology that improves their life at a cost they can afford and that it seems fairly safe and it doesn't seem too weird, they will take it. So everyone that has a smartphone, which is now a couple billion people on the planet, everyone that wears eyeglasses or has a contact lens or has done LASIK, uh, those are all transhumanists. You could say everyone who wears clothes is a transhumanist at some level. Uh, so what people say transhumanist, what they really mean is kind of a, a transhuman technology enthusiast, somebody who knows that these things are coming and gets very, very, very excited about them. But in point of fact, once the technologies are widespread, most people will act in fairly similar ways. So it's a very mass of humanity and very normal thing, I think. And I think that by using words like transhumanist and extropian, we make it seem a lot weirder and a lot scarier than it needs to be.
I think uh, efforts to make utopias often end very, very, very poorly. Um, efforts to incrementally improve the lot of the world on their hand tend to work very well. So I, there's no such thing as a perfect world. I doubt that we'll ever see a perfect world. In fact, it's impossible. We simply will not. But the world gets better, mostly, year after year. It goes up and down a little bit, but the long-term trend is largely towards people living longer, being happier, having less disease, more wealth, more living space, more education, more ability to access information, travel, etc., etc., etc. So uh, we are living in the best time ever on planet Earth, as far as humans' well-being goes, and that does not arise from any attempt to create a utopia. When you look at the attempts that have been made to create utopias, mostly they've been associated with uh, steps backwards in human well-being. So Marx, I think what went wrong with Marx and his impacts in Russia, but also his longer-term impacts in China, in North Korea, in Cambodia, all these places that went to uh, very state-controlled systems, tried to do a very rigorous form of socialism, is that he ignored human nature. And, you know, from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs sounds wonderful. Socialism and communism sound extremely, extremely humane, and I love that about them. But they require a change in human nature. They require people to act in ways that people don't actually act, and that's why they break down. Whereas the thing about the market, the market sounds abhorrent. You know, people act out of self-interest, not out of uh, helping others, which is not actually how they act either. But that, that simplification of it sounds very selfish, very nasty, but it aligns with human interest and it takes the self-interest that most of us have baked in some way, our desire to see ourselves better off and our family better off and our friends better off, and it leverages it to use value for the rest of the world. So that's what I mean when I say that ignoring actual human nature is one of the, the big mistakes that we make in futurism. Marx was a futurist but he really like, created his ideal system without regard to the kind of humans that would actually populate it. With Mao's great leap forward in China, they redesigned the economy. They said farms would no longer be privately owned, they'd be communally owned. Well, that led to famine that killed millions. Okay? The same thing happened in Cambodia when the Khmer Rouge took over. They said everyone will now become a farmer, we'll all uh, live this dream of equality, and we'll all act in the same way, and guess what? Food production collapsed and millions died. So attempts to in, impose some new model what society sh should look like from the top, from an authoritarian standpoint, are usually really, really, really terrible. Um, the eugenics movement, you know, if you look at the Nazis, they had a sort of a transhumanist idea, if you will, but their way of achieving it was the barrel of a gun and implemented via authoritarianism, and that was awful. So for me, the big question is not uh, positive goals or not, or not a a better world or not, it's how do you implement it? Is it done by the top down, by uh, authoritarianism, by a controlled population, that almost never works, or is it done where you let individuals choose whatever seems best to them for themselves and their families? And when we allow that to happen, the world tends to get better. When someone decides that they're going to go into surgery and get a hip replacement to a new kind of you know, polymer hip because they've had pain for years, and they come out a few months later able to walk better, is that a transhumanist step? I think so. When someone buys an iPhone, uh, my mother has an iPhone, and uh, it used to be we'd only talk via the phone synchronously, and now she'll text me, she'll send me messages, she can see what I'm doing on Facebook, at least some of it, and she can, we can keep in touch that way, and that's enhanced her life. Is that a transhumanist movement? Yes, absolutely. So transhumanism, what that really means, it's not a word people know, but it's a word that they live out all the time, which is, I'm going to do something to increase my abilities beyond what most humans ever had because it offers me value. And that's the kind of transhumanism that is implemented around us all the time and that will actually succeed. We are threatened by the alien. 
We're a tribal species. We evolved in small nomadic bands where everyone that you knew you were related to. And if you didn't know someone, there was a good chance they were a competitor or a threat. So we fear the different. Okay? But when you look at numbers, at least here in the United States, you look at how people perceive people of other races, other genders, other sexual orientations, other religions. Our ideas of what's normal change all the time. We are genetically a very tribal species. We evolved in small nomadic bands where anyone that you did not know was outside of your family, outside of your tribe, and probably a threat or a competitor. Yet now we have at an all-time highs of tolerance, at least in this country, for other races, other genders, other sexual orientations, and other religions. When you look at surveys, people's attitudes, would you vote for someone of this race, this religion, this sexual orientation for president? All of those have gone up. Would you have someone of this race, this sexual orientation, this religion, this gender, et cetera, et cetera, over to your home for dinner? All of those have gone up continually over the last 40, 50 years. So as we get exposed to something, we become more accustomed to it and it looks less weird. And that weird factor is what provides a lot of the uh, reluctance and resistance to anything that's new. So absolutely, as we see things happen, as we see early adopters try out some new technology and we see it work for them, we'll get accustomed to it and eventually we'll accept it. It's possible that the young generation will get more benefit out of uh, new technologies than the older ones will. Um, there are many situations we see where a treatment or a genetic change, something of that nature, has a bigger impact uh, when taken earlier in life than later in life. So I do think that'll have a, a positive effect. Uh, in many ways, society is sort of slanted towards the old. The old tend to have more wealth. Uh, they vote more, they have more power. If you look inside the United States, at least, uh, what you see in our tax system is actually a large transfer of wealth from young to old is what happens in, in a large sense. So I think enhancing the young is probably a, a very good thing. At the same time, people are going to want to enhance themselves in maturity and later in life. A big driver for all sorts of enhancement technology is going to be aging because people do not want to get old. In fact, no matter what your views are about death, many people feel okay with the fact that they're gonna die eventually. No one really likes the aging process. So there's huge sales of products with marginal, at best, effectiveness to make you look and feel and think younger. Uh, as technologies come on the market that promise to actually keep you sharp as you age, to uh, keep you more vigorous and maybe to extend your life a little bit, I think the elderly, or at least the middle-aged, or the 40-somethings and 30-somethings will embrace those technologies as well. So we have yet to see what the net effect will be, who's going to benefit more. We'll see. Well, there's different arguments out there. With Leon Kaff, it's really uh, this notion that we have a certain fixed human nature and we shouldn't get too uppity, sort of. Uh, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't fulfill all of our desires. We shouldn't become too powerful or life will lose meaning. But the reality is that no matter how much capability we add, there are always new challenges out there. Boredom doesn't seem to be the, the major challenge uh, facing us at all. Uh, Francis Fukuyama has a much more subtle and nuanced argument, I think, which is that transhumanism undermines the fundamental basis of democracy. That we have this notion of all men are created equal, uh, but what if some people are really twice as smart as other people? Maybe they should have all the rights and other people shouldn't. Uh, I sort of sympathize. It's a much better argument than most opponents have, but I don't think it's very realistic. A, because of these factors of technology cost coming down, I think, again, we'll have early adopters that get the technology when it's very expensive and not very good. And then by the time most people are able to afford it, it'll be a lot better. So it'll get cheaper over time and spread on access. And B, because the trend of civil liberties and protections in our society is not towards taking them away from the underclass and the, to the upper class, it's the way around. You have things like the Americans with Disabilities Act. What you have is that we're more and more inclusive of people that have fallen behind in some way, 
in terms of their fundamental rights at any rate, um, and in terms of forcing businesses and public places to make accommodations for them, for instance. So I just don't see that happening. I think that the kind of self-named transhumanist community, people who call themselves transhumanists, are probably too enthusiastic about technologies that aren't here yet and uh, a little blind to some of the ones that are here right now. Uh, there are some very prosaic things that are extremely effective. Getting physical exercise is more effective than any known smart drug and just about as effective as any known antidepressant. Uh, you know, going out and learning a new language, going out and learning a new skill. These are actually choices you can make right now that today are as effective as any kind of biotech enhancement you could possibly get. So I think uh, we tend to get a little too obsessed about, I want immortality, I want my uploading and so on, and yet ignore some of the practical things you can do to improve your life and your abilities right now. I think the singularity is a very big, scary word, uh, and I don't really care for it, to be totally honest. Um, there is a lot that we can understand about the future. We don't understand the exact shape of it, but we kind of understand the laws of physics, at least in a coarse sense, and economics and so on. Uh, do I think that after 2045, everything will change and everything will be understandable to us? No, not at all. Do I think that eventually we'll get to intelligence that is greater than human level? Yes, I do. I think it might take quite a long time. I doubt it'll happen in 2045. I think it's uh, much more of a century-long process, or maybe even longer than that. When we get there, will that immediately solve all the world's ills? No, it will not. That won't immediately solve poverty. That won't immediately solve hunger. It won't immediately fix the climate. Uh, will that first intelligence that's a little bit smarter than humans suddenly ramp itself into godlike intelligence? No, it's not going to happen. We already have superhuman intelligences. How many people work at Intel designing the next generation of chips? You have teams of thousands of people at Intel augmented by hundreds of thousands of the fastest computers on the planet who then themselves rely upon teams of thousands of metallurgists and thousands of people who work on the next generation of lithography techniques who themselves rely on the world's fastest supercomputers and they make progress at the pace that they make and it turns out that each additional step is probably harder than the last step so the idea that the day that you have a human plus one level intelligence you immediately start ramping up to human times one billion intelligence uh, it's been tested and it hasn't happened so it's a much more of a slow process. We are increasing our computational ability. We're increasing our collective intelligence, if you will. But the problems are also getting harder that we face. Is the world getting better? Absolutely. Are we enhancing our abilities? Absolutely. But it's not going to be some magical point in time when everything explodes and uh, the first AI to be created rules us all as a god. That's just an apocalyptic vision that doesn't have any bearing on reality. I mean, I think we are, we have our individual intelligence and we're augmenting it largely via devices that connect us to each other and to each other's externalized intelligence uh, more and more. So what we're really getting better and better at is wiring individual intelligences together into smarter and smarter group intelligences uh, because we have things like Wikipedia. Wikipedia is just a repository of the combined knowledge of lots of people in a convenient form. But because we have things like uh, online archives of papers that you can go access. So it's easier than ever for a scientist to find out what a scientist across the globe had actually done. So in all of those ways, we are boosting our intelligence and it's a magical, wonderful thing to see. Um, at the same time, the problems we face uh, keep getting more challenging at each step as well. So it's a good thing that we're boosting our intelligence because we need it. You know, I just reiterate that we are all transhumanists, that uh, I have scarcely ever met someone who is not a transhumanist. I've met many people who've never heard the word, uh, but the vast majority of humanity actually is very open to technologies that improve their lives at the right price and with the right safety. Mm -hmm.